I had not heard of Frank Turek about a week ago, but then I stumbled across one of his videos. His four best arguments against evolution. And you know I love the hit back against an anti-evolution video. So that's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tim Fall Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Right, back to Frank Turek then and his issues with another book, The Origin of Species. He apparently has four of the best arguments against evolution. And I'm wondering how many of these I would have heard of before. Probably a few. Let's get stuck into this one, shall we? I think macroevolution is false on the merits, not because of the Bible. Leave the Bible out of it for a minute. When you look at the evidence for macroevolution, I not only think the evidence is weak for macroevolution, there is very strong evidence against it. Is there though? Because many people say that and then fall short. Let's see, shall we? You said you believe in an old earth yeah. and uh, that the Bible doesn't really prescribe a certain age of the earth. Mm -hmm. So I would just want to know how you kind of knit together the idea of like old earth, uh, the Genesis account, perhaps even uh, evolution. Is there a historical atom, whatnot? Of course I believe in a historical Adam, and I think God created Adam out of the dust, just like it says. It makes a lot more sense than natural laws did it, right? <laughs> Actually, Frank, no. Claiming a fully formed human was sculpted from dust does not make more sense than natural processes. Because natural laws don't just do it by magic, evolution explains how small changes over time produces complex life. Frank wants to keep the earth old because that evidence is undeniable, but still reject evolution. So he invents this halfway house where he can accept geology but deny biology. Uh, so yes, uh, God created Adam out of the dust. When that happened, I don't know. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Uh, how does like um, creation and um, evolution play into the uh, Genesis well, account? Well, first of all, is... I, I think macroevolution is false on the merits, not because of the Bible. Leave the Bible out of it for a minute. When you look at the evidence for macroevolution, I not only think the evidence is weak for macroevolution, there is very strong evidence against it. Okay. So macroevolution is about significant evolutionary changes that happen over long periods of time. Think of the difference between saying dogs can evolve different coat colors, microevolution, to dogs and bears share a common ancestor from millions of years ago, macroevolution. Now every major field of biology supports macroevolution. Fossil records, comparative anatomy, embryology, and most of all genetics. We can literally map the family tree of life in our DNA. That's not weak evidence, Frank. It really isn't. I'll just give you a few real quickly with the acronym LIFE, L-I-F-E. L stands for the fact that there's a limited capacity for change. Like for example, uh, dog breeders try and breed dogs, right? And they get a dog as small as a Chihuahua and as large as a Great Dane. But even with all their intelligence, they can't break the genus of dogs. Why do we think a non-intelligent process can break that genus, can, can break those limits? Doesn't make any sense, right? Ah, the old dogs stay dogs argument. Dog breeding doesn't disprove evolution, it actually proves it. Chihuahuas and Great Danes look like they belong on different planets. Yet, they're still genetically compatible. We've observed massive variation over a single species in just a few thousand years through our selective breeding. Now that's a great example of how much change can occur in a relatively small amount of time. Now imagine scaling that up over millions of years and countless generations. Those small incremental changes accumulate. That's exactly how you get what we call macroevolution. There is no invisible barrier at all from stopping a population diverging far enough to become a different species. So if selective breeding that we do with dogs in a few thousand years can stretch a species from a Chihuahua to a Great Dane, then given enough time, these changes can accumulate absolutely to the point where a new gene Forms. The I stands for irreducible complexity. And Michael Behe introduced this back in 1996 with his book Darwin's Black Box, where he points out that there are so many aspects of uh, living things that you can't build gradually, that they're irreducibly complex, that all the pieces and all the parts have to be in place in working order to have any function at all. You can't get there gradually. Like you can't get. Uh, you know, Richard Dawkins talked about, well, maybe our, uh, our eyes were developed through some sort of gradual process where we had at first uh, sort of light-sensitive cells and then they evol eventually evolved into an eye. What Dawkins doesn't seem to realize is that light-sensitive cells are irreducibly complex themselves and that to get to an eye, 
uh, light sensitive cells aren't a prerequisite to an eye and you'd have to have vision the whole way through with all the parts there at the same time. So it, it, it doesn't work. The thing is, every time scientists have looked at these so-called irreducibly complex systems, they've found perfectly good evolutionary pathways for them. Frank says you can't get an eye gradually, but we've literally observed intermediate stages in nature. Some animals have nothing more than light sensitive patches. No lens, no retina, just cells that can distinguish between light and dark. Others have simple cut shaped eyes, giving a sense of direction of the light. Then there's pinhole eyes, lens shaped eyes, compound eyes, it's a spectrum, not an on off switch. And here's the thing, each step provides a survival advantage. Even a tiny ability to detect shadow or light is better than nothing at all. Natural selection builds on that advantage little by little. That is not irreducible complexity. The F stands for the fact that the fossil record does not comport with macroevolution, it, it comports with instantaneous creation, because according to their dating, the Cambrian explosion, where most major body phyla or body plans appear, they appear in the geological record about 530 million years ago in a geological instant. It looks more like creation rather than this long series of gradual fossils that we should find if macroevolution were true. Frank calling something a geological instant doesn't mean it happened overnight. In geological terms, the Cambrian explosion happened over 20 million years. That's longer than humans have ever existed as a species. Hardly a pop into being, is it? Second, the idea that nothing existed before the Cambrian explosion period is just wrong. We've got fossils of complex life that predate it. What changed in the Cambrian wasn't that life suddenly appeared out of nowhere, but that conditions significantly improved for fossilization. And finally, even in the Cambrian period itself, we do see gradual change. Transitional forms between major groups do exist. That explosion wasn't creation, it was diversification, fueled by an evolutionary arms race, plus an oxygen increase in ecological opportunities. This is a great problem for Darwin. He said, if my theory is true, why isn't the geological strata filled with all these intermediate fossils? He said, but don't worry, we'll invest it and we'll, I'll be vindicated. Well, for the past 160 years, we've been investigating the fossil record and Darwin isn't vindicated. Okay, there are huge gaps in the fossil record. Yes, Darwin admitted that the fossil record in his time was not adequate, but that was in 1859. He didn't have modern paleontology or radiometric dating or DNA analysis. What's happened in the 160 years since? Well, exactly what Darwin predicted would happen. We found a treasure trove of transitional fossils. And of course, yes, there are gaps still. Fossilization is rare. Conditions have to be perfect. And most organisms never fossilize at all. But despite that, the record we do have is packed with transitional fossils. And that maps the evolutionary story beautifully. And E stands for something known as epigenetic information. And that is the idea that there are, there are structures in the cell that are required for life and for the cell to function that can't be modified by mutating DNA. And you can't modify epigenetic information by mutating it. In other words, uh, maybe an analogy would be the, if you have a software program uh, in your uh, computer, say an architecture program to build a house, you can come up with a plan to build the house, but is the architecture program gonna give you the nails, the wood, the lumber, the concrete to build the house? No, the architecture program is like DNA, it's the software. The hardware of a living thing is called epigenetic information, and in order to get a new body plan, you need to modify epigenetic information. The problem is if you try and modify epigenetic information early on in the embryonic process, the living thing dies, it's lethal. Epigenetics simply refers to chemical modifications that affect how genes are expressed, like turning an on and off switch. Now DNA influences those switches and can be passed down across generations. Now that means epigenetics actually adds another layer to how organisms adapt and evolve. It doesn't replace DNA, it works alongside it. And secondly, your analogy is flawed. DNA isn't just software that needs magical hardware to appear, the hardware proteins, cellular structure, and regulatory systems all arise from interactions within DNA and its expression. So this is why on November 7th, 2016, in London, the Royal Society called together a meeting 
And the premise of the meeting was the Darwinian theory of evolution doesn't work. We need to find a new theory. So they all met there in 2016. They pointed out several problems with neo-Darwinian theory, and they didn't come up with a new theory because there isn't one. This is just wrong. In 2016, the Royal Society hosted a conference on evolutionary biology. The topic, how modern discoveries like epigenetics can extend our understanding of evolution beyond the classic 20th century framework. That's not the same thing as Darwin was wrong, evolution doesn't work. Not even close to it. Every single scientist there accepted evolution as a fact. The discussion was about refining and expanding evolutionary theory with new insights, not throwing it all in the bin. Okay, so not only is the evidence for macroevolution weak, in my opinion, there's evidence against it, and I just gave you four, I could go on. Okay, so I don't think it works. But look, let's suppose macroevolution is true. Does that mean there's no God? No. Does that mean Jesus didn't rise from the dead? No. No. So no. even if it's true, it doesn't defeat Christianity. And this is where the heart of the problem lies. I don't accept evolution because it defeats Christianity. I accept it because of the evidence. I don't care what Christianity or any religion thinks of it. And this is the crux of the whole discussion. Many religious people feel that evolution threatens their beliefs. No evolutionist is worried about religion with respect to evolution. Even if they're religious, it doesn't enter their heads. Do you know why? Because it deals in facts and evidence. I just don't think it's true based on the merits. And if macroevolution is true, the natural laws that drive it are still created by a lawgiver who created these laws and sustains them. So you're not getting rid of, for, for, uh, you're not getting rid of God even if it's true. Then why do you seem to be so concerned with it then? You can believe in God and still accept evidence-driven science. It's simple. So would you say, uh, sorry to keep going, but would you say that uh, just the world probably developed for a few million years and then God just put Adam in just a random set of time? Well, it wasn't random according to God. Oh, of course. I don't know when Adam came into existence. There's all sorts of different theories. William Lane Craig has a theory. He wrote a book called The Historical Adam, which I haven't read yet, so I can't recommend it. I don't know. Um, there's a Four Views book on the historical Adam that's coming out. William Lane Craig is a contributor to it. I just got an email that it's coming out, but I haven't seen it yet because it's not out yet. So there's a lot of different views. And whichever side you come down on, it doesn't defeat Christianity. Amen. All right? All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, there we go. A very interesting insight from Frank Turek there. And I want to finish with this. Evolution works. It explains the diversity of life. It's supported by fossils, genetics, and observation. And it continues to be one of the most successful scientific theories ever derived. Frank Turek's acronym LIFE ironically is lifeless when it comes to evidence. Thanks so much for watching today. It's very much appreciated. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe to the channel. And if you really enjoyed it, a big thumbs up would be welcome too. Thank you. I've been Simon and Dan. Have yourselves a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow for the return of CC. He's back. See you then. <laughs>